you. Thank you. Thank you all very much and welcome. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition where we try to take a look at sacred scripture through the lens of sacred tradition. And based on a question I had some time ago, it's uh, very important to understand that by tradition, we don't just mean any sort of innovation or that became a tradition later on. What we mean by sacred tradition is the uh, tradition that goes back to the apostles that they passed on to their disciples. So it's only apostolic tradition that has authority. So Christmas trees are pretty, and it's a nice tradition from Germany, but it's not from the apostles. So you don't have to, under pain of sin, believe in Christmas trees. <laughs> But you, um, and that's why you can have fake ones or real ones. But uh, with um, apostolic tradition, these are the teachings that go all the way back to the uh, apostles and the earliest fathers of the church. Now, of course, if you have any questions or comments for the show, you can let us know. Either email us or go online to our Facebook or YouTube pages and check those out. That would be a, a good thing, and we'll try to respond to them. Today, because of a variety of other circumstances, I'm going to uh, just uh, do a mailbag show, which is kind of good because I'm getting way behind in uh, my emails, <laughs> way behind. I try to keep up, but I can't. I just can't. Uh, so we'll answer some of them here. So let's start off with one that we have. Um, got this uh, a little bit earlier uh, in the summer. Um, Dear Father Mitch, early this summer, Bishop Thomas Tobin of Rhode Island urged Catholics not to support LGBTQ Pride Month events. That's stuff that goes on usually in June, uh, various parades especially. Understand his position since the Old Testament is clear on the issue of homosexuality. However, I can find no reference in the New Testament as to whether Jesus had addressed this issue. I'm aware that on different occasions his teachings were in conflict with that of the Old Testament and as a result resulted in reversals, reversals of historical biblical teaching, one being the bill of divorce that had been allowed by Moses, another being the stoning to death of adulterers. Is there any change in the Catholic Church's position on the issue as a result of scripture or tradition. Also, I would appreciate the church's teaching, teach position on Catholics attending a gay wedding. Uh, John in Manchester, New Jersey. Uh, John, uh, you know, you're uh, correct to note that in the four Gospels and in Acts of the Apostles, uh, the issue of ho homosexuality was not addressed. Christ never brought it up. Now, why do you think that might be? It was already prohibited in the Old Testament under pain of death. And you don't address an issue that's not taking place anymore. For instance, if you've never, I don't know if you've ever noticed, I've never condemned in my shows the stoning of adulterers. Why not? We don't do it. Now, why would I say you better not stone adulterers? That's not even an issue, is it? Now, they, they, somebody else might try to kill them, your spouse might, or something, and I'll address that if need be. <clears throat> but, you know, the issue of public stoning of adulterers, you don't bring it up. Why not? Because it doesn't happen. Our Lord didn't need to address it. It was not an issue where he lived. However, as the apostles traveled around the Mediterranean world and came in contact with the Greek and Roman culture, they did address it because this was a part of Greco-Roman culture. Uh, that now, the, the, 
never did the Greeks or the Romans ever have such a thing as homosexual marriage. That didn't, that didn't happen. And it was no institution. It was not part of their law. But they took homosexuality and those kinds of relationships and prostitution and a variety of things along that line as part of their culture. And they laughed at it. They mocked various people. You know, you see, you know, uh, Julius Caesar, for instance, was ridiculed by Cicero for that and some others, you know, in some of the literature. But it wasn't something that was condemned. It was just part of culture. When St. Paul, you know, approached the issue or uh, Jude, in the letter to Jude, you see it criticized. And I think also in Second Peter. When they came across it among the uh, Gentiles, then they addressed the issue. But Jesus didn't have to because it wasn't an issue. And you don't criticize something that's not happening. So that's, that's uh, what we would have. And, you know, first of all, in terms of uh, uh, attending a gay wedding, the, the church does not recognize that there is such a thing as a marriage between two people of the same gender. You, you, people, two people of the same sex cannot get married. As we don't recognize that as marriage. And therefore, attendance, it would be, of course, problematic. You know, um, this is attending something that uh, we don't recognize. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States does. We didn't vote for that, did we? This wasn't voted on by folks in general. In fact, um, these kind of acts were voted on as something that states voted against. That's been the, the history of our nation. The states voted against it and voted for incarceration. That's why people who, um, you know, every so often you hear folks say, well, we should have something more democratic. Let's get rid of the, um, uh, the, the college of electors, you know, the, the electoral college. Um, you know, I don't know if you really want to go there because you, you might find that you don't find as much support. But, <clears throat> you know, it was the Supreme Court that decriminalized same-sex relations and then um, ordered the recognition of uh, same-sex marriage. But that's not something that the church recognizes or anybody else because it misses out on the complementarity between man and woman that is therefore open to new life. That's one of the things that's key. Marriage is open to life. And it's, that's part of it. You know? And so this is a, a very um, important aspect of our teaching. And the, the reason you know, that Bishop Tobin um, urged people not to go to gay pride parades is that for the most part, they include an awful lot of lewdness. There's, in some places, total nudity or partial nudity. Um, that's just not right for people to be seen. You know, it, it's, this is not part of the, um, uh, uh, the, the issue. And uh, this is something that we can't go on. And so this is uh, also going to be harmful to uh, children especially, especially when you see that it's promoting uh, not only a way of life uh, that is contrary to church teaching and contrary to uh, nature, but one that's very dangerous. You know, um, if we had a parade of people who are in favor of smoking and they were going around with giant cigarettes that were giving off cigarette smoke that everybody in the parade inhaled. Would you be in favor of that? No. No, I, I, I mean, I, most of us today 
do not want to be around uh, cigarette smoke because secondhand smoke causes cancer and people do die from it, right? So we don't want to be around that. We, want, we don't want that promoted like we used to back in the, the 60s. They promoted cigarette smoking on television, everywhere else. The government used to give you cigarettes. However, the interesting thing is that the life expectancy of smokers is 69. That's 10 years less than the average. The life expectancy of homosexuals is 46. 46. 47 for lesbians. And so that is uh, 23 years less than smokers. You know, do we want to promote something that has problems, not only for the moral health, but also for the physical health? This is a question we ought to ask and bring up. So that's something there. All right, uh, let's see here. We have an email from Charlie. Father Mitch, we recently had a study on the Mass. When the discussion came to the subject of, say, a funeral, non-Catholics or infrequent worshipers come to receive and the priest presents the host to them. Some thought it would be in poor form to deny them the body of Christ. My wife and I were pretty firm that this is wrong. Understanding some had children who had fallen away or gone to another faith, felt the right that they should be allowed. How do we, lead, how do we delicately bridge this dilemma? Charlie, Charlie, uh, this is something that uh, in our, in our uh, church missiles, you know those uh, missilettes that we have. Now they used to be for every month. Now they're for like a whole year or so, or half a year, whatever they are. Um, it mentions in there that uh, communion is reserved for Catholics who are not in the state of mortal sin, who are in the state of grace, and. Here at EWTN, we do what a lot of parishes do, which is we make that announcement before Mass starts so that you let people know ahead of time. And it's um, uh, something uh, you know, that is worth mentioning, in particular at events like funerals. He mentions that. Uh, in particular, funerals and weddings, that you know, um, you know, we don't have open Holy Communion, and um, you know, it, it's not that we dislike other people, but the issue at stake is their conscience. If they do not have a conscience that accepts the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, that we believe this is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It is not a symbol of Jesus. It is his body and blood. It's no longer bread. It's the body and blood of Christ. It has the uh, form of bread and wine, but it is not bread. Its essence is now the uh, Christ, and that its substance or essence has been uh, transformed by the word of Christ and by the Holy Spirit. This is our faith. That's why many martyrs have died for the Eucharist in the Catholic Church. That's been part of our history. We take it that importantly. And if people don't share that faith, they ought not receive. This is not something that the church just sort of comes up with, you know, and, um, in, um, you know, uh, says that this is uh, a problem for us. Let me just get to a passage here in Scripture where St. Paul gives some uh, clarification of it. it says, uh, and this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment 
upon himself. So what we're doing in withholding communion is not saying you don't belong to our club and you don't know the secret handshake and therefore you can't receive communion. That's not what it's about. It's about this fact that we um, don't want someone to eat and drink judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. So this is a, a serious issue. Now, if somebody does believe what we believe, then we need to invite them to make public uh, profession of faith because our faith contradicts that of most of the other uh, denominations. You know, the Lutherans uh, you know, believe in consubstantiation as something else. The Episcopalians, in the 39 Articles of Faith, have, I think it's the no, number 39, you may not believe in transubstantiation. That's explicit. They're not, they're not allowed to believe what we believe. The people of the Calvinist tradition don't believe what we believe. The Baptists certainly don't. They don't believe that it's the body of Christ. It's simply an ordinance. And so if they disbelieve what we hold, we don't want them to receive because it goes against their conscience and ours. And as St. Paul teaches here, that they eat and drink judgment upon themselves. We don't want to do that. Uh, so that, that's why we, we do that. And I I've sometimes have used the image. I, I love Canadians. They're great people. What a nice country. And I love going up there to visit. But when I go up there, I don't register to vote because I have not taken an oath of allegiance to Canada. And they cannot come here and vote. Does that mean we don't like them? Not at all. We like Canadians. You know, Florida's economy in the wintertime depends on them. <laughs> And it's great to have them, you know, but they can't vote when they come down to Florida for the winter. You know, that's just not, not permitted. And it's not because they're bad people. It's because they haven't taken the oath of allegiance to the United States and its constitution. So, you know, they, they don't get to vote. And, uh, and likewise, I can't vote up there. That's why I don't receive, and similar, by comparison, I don't receive communion in other churches because I don't believe what they believe. I may not do that, and vice versa. <clears throat> and then we have uh, an email from Kathy. Um, Kathy asks, what about the devout Jews who have been taught their whole life the beliefs of the Jewish religion? They strongly believe their faith is correct. How will Jesus judge them? And Kathy, that's an important question. Uh, and one of the issues at stake for Jews who are you know, sincerely believe that Judaism and in good conscience follow that, Muslims who follow Islam, Christ will judge those outside the faith by the norms that we see that he mentions in Matthew chapter 25, verses uh, 31 and following, in which he says, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. What you fail to do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. You fail to do to me. Some he'll, con he'll condemn for their failure to help those who are weak, and some he will redeem because they do what is right. And he'll judge them according to their conscience, you know, uh, to the best of their ability. And so that's um, something that he taught. Because uh, remember, that parable is addressed to the nations, those outside the community of our faith. And, um, and if anybody has any judgment coming, it's we who don't evangelize them. So I have to keep that in mind. All right, we'll take a little break. We'll come back with more of your emails and questions. So please stay with us.
right, we are ready to get some more questions, but we're going to start off with our wonderful audience. We have an audience from all over the place. And um, we have a question from this young man over here. Why don't, you, why don't you hold on to it? You can hold it. Just don't chew on it. There you go. Uh, wait, where are you from? I'm from, from, I'm from College Station, Texas. College Station, Texas, the home of Texas, A&M, right? Mm -hmm. That's a great school. And what is your question? How do exorcists decide if there's a spiritual infestation in a house? How do exorcists decide if there's a spiritual infestation in a house? What, what goes on is that as in an exorcism, you, the, the exorcist needs to know about the different phenomena that are taking place and then has to determine whether or not these can be explained naturally or whether they require a supernatural explanation for them. So uh, that, that's the key issue. If it can be explained naturally, then you try to go and look at the natural uh, uh, explanations and solutions to the problem. It's only when there is uh, uh, no natural explanation and then a, a supernatural explanation becomes absolutely clear. That's when you uh, call in the exorcist. But even then, I believe the, the exorcist, even for a exercising a place would still need the permission of the bishop and would have to go to him about all that okay all right thank you for your question sir where are you from i'm from east menard texas east menard texas where is that close to it's right in between houston and victoria if you put a dot right there on 59 in between it's right that's there. it okay i know that know that route <laughs> Just wanted all the other people to know more about the great Republic of Texas. There we so, go. <laughs> so what is your question? When dealing with the LBG, the LBT uh, movement, mm -hmm. what is a good way for Catholics to approach people that are participants mm -hmm. without, we don't want to condemn the person, but we mm -hmm. don't approve of their, we, we don't like the sin. Right. What's a good way to approach them without offending yes, and that, stepping on eggshells. It, it, it is stepping on eggshells because it's not only the uh, sensitivity to the person involved, but you also are frequently enough dealing with uh, various political issues and sometimes economic. You know, the, the variety of things get involved with this. And uh, in that whole sphere, it is key that you begin with your own attitude interiorly. What do you really think and feel about these uh, situations? What is your concern? Do you have an anger inside of you or a fear? Um, or do you actually love the individuals? You know, uh, that this is something that has to be examined. If we are acting out of fear or out of anger, or in some cases even hatred, then we ought to refrain until we get our interior attitudes uh, brought before our Lord and let our Lord transform what we think on the inside first. And then only when you have the interior attitude of how you love, uh, that you do love folks who are, uh, you know, lesbian and gay and bisexual and transsexual and so on, um, that then you can approach them. Now, when there are different parts of the approach, you know, when I'm dealing in the more abstract, like the, the earlier email, was dealing with some issues in the more abstract. I present the abstract data that I am aware of. And that's different than where I would start off with individuals that I know. And I'll, I 
talks of. In fact, I enjoy talking and talking with a sense of listening to what's going on in their experience. You know, I don't, uh, st you know, I may have, you know, a, uh, ideas, everybody does, about a lot of issues. And our ideas do act as filters as to what we perceive. That's the nature of ideas. But the filters, the ideas that I have, can be flexible enough to learn to incorporate the experiences that uh, gay and uh, uh, lesbian and trans and all the other folks experience. Listen to their experience, understand them on their terms without giving up my values, my, the, the values that I have thought through and the values that I have, for instance, what I mentioned on uh, life expectancy issues. That's not because I, I, one person say, well, you just want them to die early. No, I don't. In fact, that's one of the reasons I say these things. Just as I say the same thing to heterosexual people who are promiscuous, 20% 20 uh, 20 of uh, heterosexual people are infected with various diseases, I will warn the promiscuous about this because I don't want them to be ill. I don't want them to pass various illnesses on. And I want them to have a long and healthy life. And they're not, uh, if they're promiscuous, either as a heterosexual or homosexual person, they're uh, causing trouble. Not to mention with homosexual, or, or excuse me, with heterosexual people, that their infidelities oftentimes leave children behind who are impoverished as a result of their infidelity and their lack of commitment and the lack of responsibility. I know those children you know, who are left behind in poverty and a lot of other difficulties that they have. And I want those to be addressed by heterosexual people just as the issues associated with homosexual behavior and disease want to be addressed. Not because I'm all uptight. I see the results of this. I buried homosexuals who died in the early 40s and younger. Remember, 46 is the average. There are a lot who die younger than that, way younger, and not many who live past 60. Uh, th this is something that we want to see. Wait, so what can we do to minister to this situation? And let them know that our, our concern is for your good. God's given you talents and gifts of all kinds. And we don't want you to die. We want you to live a long life and contribute that to the church and to the world. That's our goal. All right, so hopefully that helps somewhat. Have another email. Uh, this one is from Eve. Um, Eve asks, what do Calvinists say about Joshua 24, 15, when Joshua said to the Israelites, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That doesn't sound like predestination. It sounds like free will and free choice. Well, Eve, in fact, yeah, you're very much correct that it sounds like a choice is being laid before them. The, the Calvinist doctrine that God predestines you to choose, uh, well, the, well, predestines you to salvation or predestines you to condemnation. That would be traditional uh, Calvinist doctrine. Uh, the the uh, total depravity and, and so on. And um, it's not only in Joshua uh, 24 that you have to make that choice. You see, Moses tell the whole people of Israel, choose life or death. Choose the commandments of God and life or disobedience and death. But he tells them to choose. This is basic. And, you know, this is uh, 
what we very much have to keep in mind for ourselves. All right, and then um, we have another email from Nancy. Um, Dear Father Paco, my husband and I were both baptized and confirmed in the Catholic Church growing up. Each of us, as singles in our 20s and 30s, fellowshiped in various Trinitarian Protestant churches, as well as were rebaptized as adults. We met in a singles Bible study at a Southern Baptist church, and we were married by a pastor from that church. By the way, you know, Bible studies are a better place to meet future spouses than bar rooms. <laughs> just saying, just saying. But I digress. Uh, neither one of us were ever members of a Protestant church. Recently, I've reconnected with my Catholic roots. I've gone to confession. I go to Mass regularly and receive communion. My husband joins me from time to time. We also go to a local Presbyterian church together. Is our marriage sacramental? Is it okay for me to be taking communion? Nancy. Well, Nancy, sounds to me like there's a very simple little thing that you may want to do uh, more than want to. It'd be a very good thing for you to do. Go talk to your local pastor. Tell him the story. And uh, we recognize the validity of Protestant marriage. Okay, we, uh, we believe that. But uh, there's also this sense of the uh, recognition and permission by the church that and you can have your marriage regularized in the Catholic Church, very simple, private ceremony. I've done it in the past, um, and it's a very, very simple, very easy. And the only thing that they're, they're going to want to do that you haven't done yet, I'm sure, is they're also going to put a note on your baptism, baptism record as a baby Catholic because they want to make sure you don't run off and marry somebody else. And that if you do marry somebody else, they want to see a death certificate from the first one. You know, that's what they're going to look for. Just like on my baptismal certificate, there is a notice that I'm a priest. So I can't say, oh, I want to get married in church. Um, well, wait a minute, uh, there's a problem here. That's why they ask for your baptismal record. They want you to, to have that in good order. And this is about having things in good order. And, you know, it's... Um, uh, Think of it. I don't know if you have children or not, um, uh, but uh, you know your, your kids can do a good thing, but not necessarily with your permission. So, uh, and you'd want to get that settled down, wouldn't you? You know. Uh, well, mom, I, I filled the car with gas. Yeah, but you're 15 and you don't have a driver's license. <laughs> You know, you, you, want, you want to uh, get that, that settled down. Uh, so we recommend uh, strongly that you just go to your pastor. And, it, and again, it's very, very simple. Um, and so um, yeah, it sounds like you do have a wonderful marriage and that prayer and our Lord is at the, very much at the center. Um, and it's now also getting the sacramental help. And to keep in mind, that the sacrament of matrimony is a source of grace to build up your marriage. Christ wants to act more powerfully. If you think he's already acting, he's looking to give even more uh, of his grace within your marriage. Okay? All right, now I have another email from Brenda. Brenda asks, on a recent show, Father Mitch mentioned that baptism seals us into our inheritance as sons and daughters of God. How do I explain to someone advocating once saved, always saved, that being sealed in our inheritance is not the same thing as having been saved? Brenda. Well, Brenda, think about this now. There might be a family, and there are families like this. It happens. I know them in various ways. And they're, they're part of the family, and there's, the kids are all mentioned in the will. And mom and dad die and leave an inheritance to their kids. But son Johnny, the rebel, has gone away from home. 
And he doesn't have any contact with anybody. He doesn't even know that his parents have died. He doesn't know that he's in the will. And he's got this inheritance that the estate holds for him. But because of his rebelliousness, he's not there. Now, still it would be his, but he doesn't come to get it. And whose fault is that? Mom and dad's? No. He, they didn't send him away. He ran away. So he's got the responsibility for that. Now, he would belong to the family, just like uh, I've known kids who run away from home. The parents still treat them and love them as their own, but they stay away, and they don't enjoy their parents' love, or they want to enjoy it on their own terms. Well, if you love me, you'd give me the money now. No, kind of a fool. So I think we'll wait until after we die. We can't control you anymore. But I don't want to see my money spent foolishly by a fool. You know, that's good sense by a lot of parents. And, um, and that's sometimes why codicils get put into wills too. <laughs> uh, but you, you, know, you have the membership in the family of God by the seal of the Holy Spirit. But if you choose to rebel against God, then it's not available to you. Not because God doesn't want to give it to you, but that you've run away. And that's what I would say to those who would hold to once you're saved, you're always saved. Okay? Um, you know, it's, it's yours potentially, but you have to make it actual by your act of faith, your act of repentance of sin, and staying around. <laughs> you know, you persist in the faith. Persevere is the word that we use. And we'll get to that in uh, the, the Bible study that we're doing. Then we have another email. This one is from Lucia F. Hello, Father. I enjoy and look forward to your show very much. I have a quick question. How do you tell when you are being scrupulous versus being very devoted? Um, it's not always easy. And it's hard, especially for scrupulous people, to, to distinguish between them. But with scrupulosity, you are you usually racked with emotional guilt. There's a big distinction between emotional guilt and actual guilt. Some people feel guilty as a feeling for almost anything they do, even when it's not a sin. You know, and and that's, that's not healthy. Or, um, you know, well, maybe my motive wasn't perfect. And that gets at one of the other keys of scrupulosity. The scrupulous are a problem because of their pride. They say, well, I've got to have a perfect attitude toward this. And if I don't have absolutely perfect attitude, then I'm committing a sin. Well, you, you know, that's where you need to pay attention to where your arrogance is coming in, um, that you have a higher standard than anybody else. Mm, you know, the, uh, sometimes the imperfection of our motive comes because we're not paying enough attention. Not because we have bad intention, but because we're not paying attention. And, you know, human beings do drift off into other thoughts and things. And then the scrupulous will say, oh, I'm not sure I really meant it every word I said, so I got to do it all over again. No, 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 no. That, that's, that, that's where scrupulosity comes in. So what you want to do is examine your conscience to see where some of the um, uh, role of pride or arrogance comes in that I have to be more perfect than anybody else um, and where emotional guilt comes into play with that as well. Um, that's, you know, guilt, actual guilt is not a matter of how you feel about it. Uh, sociopaths have no guilt feelings at all, but they're very guilty. 
You know, they can kill somebody with zero guilt about it, even though what they've done is a serious sin. And uh, so your feelings are not the best guide to moral decision-making and guilt. Um, and Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 6 against emotional guilt versus actual guilt, uh, where you've broken a c commandment knowingly and willingly. And for that, you're guilty. But how you feel about it, not necessarily. So those are the two things you look for, pride and guilt feelings. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more questions. So please stay with us. Let's uh, go to studio question first. Sir, where are you from? Slidell, Louisiana. Love that town. Great place. And your question? Uh, I was wondering, in the early church, was do we consider tradition more important than scripture mm -hmm. since the uh, gospels weren't complete uh, for a period, of, a good period of time? Mm -hmm. And the Bible wasn't codified until, what, the, fourth, the late fourth century? And what, what scriptures did they use when they had mass? Mm -hmm. Okay, a number of interesting questions. Um, the Gospels, you know, uh, th there's a lot of different opinion about when the Gospels were written. Um, my own, you know, conviction is that St. Luke was writing, finished his Gospel and Acts of the Apostles, where Acts of the Apostles ends, namely Paul's imprisonment with no known result. What, what happened? Did he get loose or what? It, he doesn't say. You know why he doesn't say? He didn't know when he finished writing it. And that means it ends in 62. So that's just about 30 years or so after uh, Christ's death and resurrection, right? And then you take a look at Luke and you see that he uses two-thirds of Mark's gospel in his gospel. He copied two-thirds of Mark, plus he had a lot of other material that had been put in there too. So uh, that would mean that Mark was written before Luke, probably in the, by the 50s, late 50s. And um, uh, John, it would be later in 95, but I, I also think that Matthew may be earlier than a lot of scholars say, a lot of them say 85. Um, I, I don't think so. There's a, um, again, this is not total proof yet, but there's a tiny fragment of Matthew that uh, a papyrologist uh, from East Germany, uh, former East Germany, had dated to the 60s, which would mean that Matthew is also written by the 60s. Um, you know, but that's, th that would be a, some of the things have to be debated and discussed and all. But um, it wasn't too many years, and we see mention in uh, St. Justin Martyr, who was born in the Holy Land in 95. He was born in uh, what's now called the city of Nablus. Uh, in his day, it was called Neapolis, Naples but in Arabic it's pronounced Nablus. Uh, he was born there and in 95, and he is writing in Rome uh, that at Mass, they're reading from the Memoirs of the Apostles. Uh, in fact, I was in Rome last spring and was shown a papyrus of Luke and John 
So they didn't have the whole New Testament, but it was 22 chapters of Luke and 15 chapters of John that went back to 175 A.D. And so they had these collections already, and they're reading those. Uh, there's a collection of St. Paul's letters made by the 90s. Right? So we know about that. And they're reading that at the churches. And, of course, they're reading from the Old Testament. The idea of having a lectionary where you go through different readings in a cycle, that goes back to the Jewish people. They had that in the synagogue. Some synagogues had a one-year cycle. Some had a three-year cycle where they would read from the Torah, the, the first five books, you know, over that period. Uh, and then they would have other readings from the prophets, and those are called the Haftarot. Uh, and it still is the case. So the, there was a lectionary among the Jewish people, and the Christians knew that that was a beautiful and good idea. So we continued it, but we added the New Testament to Old Testament. So they're reading Old Testament as well as New Testament texts, okay? And doing so from fairly early on. Now you see that different part, different areas of the church had different collections. Um, they, they had pretty much the same books, but not always all of them. So some places did not have uh, but 22 books. And it wasn't always the same 22 books. So that it wasn't until the fourth century under Pope St. Damasus I, that the church, you know, at his direction, checked out, what are people reading? There was finally peace. During the persecutions, they couldn't do that kind of exchange. He was able to send St. Jerome out to investigate what was going on all over, and um, he and the bishops of Italy met in 382, to, and they said 27 books in the New Testament and uh, 46 in the Old. Uh, the bishops of Africa came up with the same books, and so had Saint Athanasius in uh, Egypt. So uh, they, they, there was this consensus that, that was made uh, pulling all the books together. So that's how we had that. But knowing the tradition of what the apostles passed on, like the Bishop Onesimus of Ephesus gave us the list of St. Paul's letters. Uh, and he may well be the same Onesimus mentioned in the, uh, one of Paul's letters. You know, so the slave that escaped. So you know, these different characters all come into play and they passed it on and that's how we have it. The bishops passing on to their successors what they'd received. All right. I have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Atlanta, Georgia. Great. Welcome. Just Thank neighbors you. down the road. Yes. My question is, Archbishop Gregory, or the Bishop of Atlanta, mm -hmm. recently transferred to Washington, D.C. Yes. So my question is, to determine the next bishop, mm -hmm. is there a process within the church mm -hmm. that is set that a priest will know that how to process himself through to become a bishop, or be considered to be a bishop? Yeah, there, um, there's definitely a process, and it's done on two levels, uh, locally and in Rome, so that you would have um, locally some of the bishops, or excuse me, some of the priests in the diocese who were recognized as various leaders, uh, on, usually on the staff, of the Archdiocese of Atlanta or other dioceses, they would send a list of names. Usually it's, it's a turner, that is a list of three names. These are the ones we recommend. And then there is also the uh, uh, committee in, in Rome, you know, there's a, there's a dicastery that is in charge of passing recommendations of bishops to the Pope. Now they would listen to what was sent to them, but they would also have a list 
based on their wider experience. So they might have somebody that they think would be better than is on that list. And then ultimately, that's passed on to the pope who makes the final decision. Okay? Uh, and there, are some, there might be some priests who want their names on that list. Uh, it's not always the mo biggest source of respect from the rest of us. So uh, those are the guys that we say have scarlet fever. They want to wear a bishop's scarlet color. It's a little too much. I have another question back there. Young man, where are you from? Um, College Station, Texas. So you're, are you with that other young man? Yes. I see. Well, what is your question? Um, why was abortion made? Why was abortion made? Well, I'm afraid that there are some people who do not want to have babies. And, and so they started to kill the babies inside the moms. And they just didn't want any more kids for some reason or another. Um, matter of fact, I remember back in, uh, early in the summertime, there was a 150 big corporation leaders who made a statement we need to have abortion are good for our values as business. I said, why? Most businesses want more customers. You want to kill them. Does that make sense? Or Disney, Disney Corporation. We won't make any more movies in the great state of Georgia unless you agree to kill your babies. Now, what an evil decision, especially when you're a company that makes movies for kids. Does that even make sense? Not at all. Not, at all. Not to mention the fact they didn't give life to those kids. It's not theirs to take. If you don't give the life, you can't take it. And the one who gives the life is God himself. And so you can't take something that God gave. It's his. And we have to show respect to it. So that's, that's we, it's, a, it's a bad, bad idea. All right. Well, we're come to the end. May the Lord bless all of you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And... Again, we want to remind you that Mother Angelica was inspired to have this network brought to you by you. You make it possible. And please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay all of our bills too. God bless you, and thank you.